Well, welcome everyone. Good morning. morning. And uh, it's very nice to see the sun uh, poking through. Haven't seen it in a few days. (laughs) Um, So it's going to be a beautiful day today. Really nice. Mother Earth is uh, full. I'm very happy. (laughs) Um, We were supposed to get an inch of rain. We got three and a quarter. So that was pretty good, you know. Uh, well, once again, I'd like to welcome everyone here. My name is Jake, and um, every Sunday we have usually a specific topic that we're supposed to talk about, and it's always interesting to, when, not, when it's your turn to do Sunday, to see what the topic is. And the topic today is from the unmanifest to the manifest which is a pretty broad topic. (laughs) I mean, sometimes the topics are really narrow and very specific, and you really got to struggle to, you know, put it into a service. But this one was equally hard to get it from four hours down to, you know, 20 minutes. Um, So bear with me. Uh, It might be some broad strokes uh, during during the talk. As we sit here today, if we really think back over our previous years, I'm sure we're all all going to remember those friends or family or guides or teachers that have helped us in some way and have gotten us to this place right now. And I wanted to share a little, just a sliver of my personal journey and um, in 1961 I started, I was still in high school and I started having these reoccurring dreams where I would either come come out of a building or get out of a car or whatever and I'd be blinded by this white light and it would wake me up and it only happened for like a few weeks. And I was always scratching my head thinking, what the heck, you know, I don't understand. And it was soon after that that I had this burning desire. I was living on the East Coast, and I had this burning desire to go to California. You know, just out of the blue, and I don't know. And that stayed with me year after year, all through school. And for those of you that are younger, Um, The 60s was a very interesting time. It was one of people really searching for their purpose in life and not wanting to just go with the flow. That that souls were receiving messages that going with the flow maybe wasn't really right and that we needed to find our own way, our own path in life. And so there was quite a bit of upheaval in the 60s. And um, one of the um, movements of that was back to the land. There was a real movement of getting back to the land. And Mother Earth had news, would publish everything, it was monthly. And in the back, they always had all these real estate opportunities for sale. You know, one acre in Oregon or two acres here. And, and um, I had gotten out of the, I got the chance to go to California finally in 1968, right after I got out of college. And in the 60s, there was a lot of travel done on the thumb. And I personally, and I personally hitchhiked across the country a couple times. Uh, that was another, st- many other stories I could share. But um, I ended up hitchhiking to California and spent probably six weeks. And I really, after all, since 61, all those seven years of wanting to go to California, um, I got here and it was like, I felt like I was home. I just went, man, this is where I'm supposed to be. And then the army knocked on my door and I got drafted. So I had to spend two years in the Army. So when I came out of the Army in 1970, 
I was living in New York City, and I had changed my diet, became a vegetarian, and my friend said, hey, we should go to some yoga classes. And you got to understand that it, in 1970, yoga and meditation was not uh, an everyday word. Uh, there weren't very many yoga centers, and there wasn't much talk about meditation. And, um, but there was one in Manhattan, and I would go there on Saturdays, and it was uh, Hatha Yoga. And it was um, one of the centers that Swami Satchidananda started. And he had many centers across the country. And so we would learn these meditation, or these, I'm sorry, these uh, exercise techniques. And at the end, we would do a little meditation practice. It was a very basic meditation practice that was taught to us. And I had never meditated before. And we found out um, that Satchidananda was coming to Manhattan. He was going to speak at Columbia University. So I went, man, I got to go. I got to meet this guy. I got to see him. So we went with some friends, and um, I was probably, it was quite a large auditorium. There was probably 2,000 people there or something. And I was sitting probably three quarters of the way back. But it was life-changing for me. I mean, he, his words, first of all, I felt like he was looking right at me, but I know he wasn't, but it felt like he was. And the words were just hitting me, you know, here, and I could feel changes happening within me, and it was really a life-changing experience to, to be in his presence. So I you know, found myself in Manhattan, and I, I really wanted to still go back to California. And I would look in Mother Earth News, and I just knew I didn't have the skills to develop a, a homestead. <laughs> or, and I also felt this desire that I wanted to be around other people. I didn't want to just be isolated somewhere in the mountains. Um, so I... At the time, there was a real movement uh, of communities happening around the country, around the world, actually. But in the country, in this country especially, there was communities popping up everywhere with people come together and live on a piece of land or, you know, share a uh, building somewhere or whatever. And there was a book that was published that listed the better known communities in the country. And so I bought the book and. In 1972, I finally set off uh, to ultimate goal to go to California, but also to check out some communities along the way. And the reason for that was because I, I kept practicing the meditation that I learned in the yoga class, not on a regular basis, but there was this one Saturday afternoon where I just felt moved to do that. And so I got my little cushion together and I sat down and I started meditating. And I had this incredible, I never had one before, but I had this vision of this really beautiful field and this group of people just singing and dancing and having fun. And I really felt like that was where I wanted to be. I wanted to be with people like that. So anyway, I left and um, went to a couple communities that just didn't didn't click with me and and just like Patty's experience I ended up in Santa Barbara and I needed some natural food and so I asked around and they said oh there's this little store on State Street and I said okay so I wandered in I looked at the sign it said Sunburst Community Store I said okay so I walked in and I felt like I had just walked in the front door of my house you know I just felt at home and I thought wow this is a strange feeling and I was walking around and there were some photographs on the wall and there was this picture of Norm and I was like I know this guy I mean I've seen this guy somewhere and it was just it, it just shocked my system and I asked the cashier what the heck's going on and she told me there was a community up in the mountains above Santa Barbara and it was open to new members which some a lot of the communities that I checked out weren't open for new members and I was like, wow, this is unbelievable. California community. 
<laughs> people with like mind seeking seeking spirit. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll check it out. So that was a while ago. That was seventy-two, and uh, I'm still here. They can't can't pull me away. <laughs> and um, it was interesting because when I look back on it, I probably seventy percent of the reason I came was for community, and thirty percent was for spirit. You know, I just didn't have that development within me yet, awareness of spirit. What's taught Korea, and, it, and at the time we were, um, uh, we had businesses downtown and we had uh, the farm up, up in the mountains, and we all meditated every, together every morning and every evening. And so it was a practice every day, morning and evening, morning and evening. And so I would practice Kriya. And I started feeling this inner awareness starting to happen and my inner senses starting to wake up. And I started feeling this movement of the divine within me and around me. And it was, it was life-changing again. I was just... It probably started happening about maybe four months of practicing Kriya morning and night. <clears throat> and I remember we had a... Um, that first Christmas, I was at the farm in 72. Norm came up and... You got to understand, this man was, had lived a pretty hard life because nobody would listen to him from, from the early 50s until the 60s when people were waking up and seeking people that could teach them about spirit. And he was just beaming because we were, there was probably, I don't know, 40 or 50 of us in the room, in the meditation room on Christmas Day. And he was just beaming because he was so happy that this was manifesting and that he was a part of it. And he looked around and he said, all of your questions will be answered. And I was like, wow. And I got to say, a lot of my questions have been answered, but I still have a lot more. And by generating that energy within us of, of Kriya, practicing Kriya, again, it opens up our awareness, opens up our senses, and we receive messages and we can understand things that we didn't understand before. It's, it's just amazing, the practice of Kriya. Norm once said that <clears throat> somebody that attains cosmic consciousness is, their consciousness is 180 degrees from self-consciousness. And Yogananda said for, of one that has attained cosmic consciousness, they are aware of everything, everywhere, but at the same time, whatever, call, <clears throat> excuse me, whatever calls for their specific human attention, their human mind functions in a human way. But inwardly, however, their inner consciousness embraces all existence. And I have to say, in all the years I was around Norm and, and knew him and talked to him, I felt that in him. He would deal with the, what happened, had to happen, uh, what had to be decided at that moment. But there was a whole lot of other stuff going on in his consciousness all the time. And you could, he was like a, a live wire almost. You could feel it. You could feel him vibrating. And the fact that he, his consciousness was 180 degrees from ours was very helpful. <laughs> um, there's a little story that um, at one point I found myself, and I don't know if Jonathan's here, uh, Jonathan King and I were working, we had, Sunburst had a produce warehouse in Los Angeles. And uh, we had five stores and a juice factory in Santa Barbara. And we were, at the time, we were the largest natural food um, distributor in the country. And at one point, we had to um, 
Sunburst went through some changes. A lot of the people that came when they were young decided they didn't want to be here anymore because they came for community, mostly, and um, they were getting older, they were getting married, and they were having kids, and they just wanted to go off on their own. So we had a lot of people exiting Sunburst, and all the businesses were supported by the labor of Sunburst members. So we had to start downsizing, and we started closing things. And there was a point where we had to gather together some, have a meeting with some of the people that we owed money to in one of the, one of the businesses. And so the four of us got together, and we came up with this very logical plan of how we were going to present it. And we got on the phone with Norm and told him about it. And he goes, well, that's very logical. But this is how we should do it. And it was 180 degrees different. <laughs> and it worked, and it was perfect, and everybody was happy, and it all got worked out. I wanted to touch a little bit on Norm's cosmic conscious experience that he had in his early 20s, which is a really young age uh, for this to happen. And it's in his book, which is, um, I'm not going to do it total justice, but it, it, it's very inspiring to read and understand what he went through. But he, um, he was continuing to meditate. He was living in Santa Barbara. And um, he started having these feelings in his meditation that something was coming, and he wasn't sure what it was. And he had an experience on a, Saturdays was his big meditation day because he worked really hard during the week. And he had this experience where Mother Divine appeared to him. And he felt like there was more coming. And a week went by and he was coming home on a Friday night and he saw on the marquee of a theater that the Song of Bernadette was showing and he really wanted to see it. And he went in and saw that and got very inspired by it. And Saturday morning he got up and, you know, arranged his, you know, meditation area on top of his bed. And he had his mala meditation beads, which are usually hopefully, strung with 108 beads. And they're very helpful um, to keep, keep our concentration focused as we meditate. Like if you're sitting in a chair, you can hold the beads, like have it hanging down off your knee, and you just, each time you do a circulation, you move your thumb and go to the next bead. Or if you're sitting on the floor, you just have it on one of your knees, and you do it that way. Very helpful. At first, when you start, it's a little distracting, but after a while, it, it just becomes automatic. And um, it's helpful because if your mind starts wandering, you've got these beads in your hand, and you're like, oh, yeah, I got to come back and start doing my circulations again. So, Norm started, he had the mallows in his hand, and he was, started his meditation, and he had pure 100% concentration on Kriya no thoughts going anywhere as he went through each bead. And he f kept feeling like something was going to happen. And he was getting close to the 108th bead, and he, he just said, I don't, you know, I hope something happens. And when he got to the 108th bead, Mother Divine appeared to him and said, and offered him up. She raised her hands like this and offered him up to the Divine to the Father. And the Father appeared as this brilliant light. And Norm's spine stiffened and his head went back. And the Spirit said, are you ready to die today? And without any hesitation, Norm said, yes, I am ready to die today, to be with you. And at that point, that light just rushed to him and totally engulfed him. And he found his pure self, his inner self, rise up out of the body as a sphere and start floating. 
And it started rising and rising and rising. <clears throat> Pretty certain the earth was below him, and he kept going up and up. And he found himself in a pristine, quiet space. And, in, and then before him was this bubble, which was creation. He had actually ascended out of creation and was gazing back at it. And he thought, he thought, am I God? You know, what, what is this? And then he felt this presence around him and said, now that you have seen my son, I must put you back. And he found himself rushing back down through, through creation, through the dimensions, back down through the roof of the house he was renting and into his body again. And when he finally was able to unlock his legs and get feeling back in his body again, he looked at the clock and seven and a half hours had gone by. And he had been breathless and his heart had stopped beating and yet he, there he was, alive again. You can read about, in Autobiography of Yogi, you can read about Yogananda's cosmic conscious experience, which was different. Everybody's experience is different. And he also had a beautiful experience with, as Sri Yukteswar thumped him on the chest and, and bam, he was in a cosmic conscious state. So when we talk about the topic of the unmanifest to the manifest, if we really think about how we might have a thought, just maybe out of the blue, I want to build a table. <laughs> just a spark, just a little thought, unmanifested. And then you, your brain and you start kicking in and you start building a plan of how you're going to build this table, the materials you're going to need, the tools, so on and so forth. And then you build it and you have it. And so you've gone from the unmanifest to the manifest, that process. So I wanted to try to talk about the ultimate, in my mind, in my opinion, the ultimate example of the unmanifest coming into the manifest. And that is the dawn of creation. And Norm explains this in a book called Sacred Science, which we have uh, had out of print for a few years, but we're going to release it again this year. <clears throat> and we have to understand is that experience he had of cosmic consciousness awakened him to so many things. And he was able to put into words the dawn of creation. And it's, it's phenomenal. And it's, it takes reading it over and over and over again to really start to grasp it. And so I'm going to just kind of touch on it. But it really helps if we close our eyes and use our imagination and follow along. And then as, as I complete it, we'll uh, have some bowls and go into our, our meditation for about 15 or 20 minutes. In the Bible, <clears throat> it says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. But before there was a beginning, divine spirit existed as an infinite sea of life and energy. And imagine yourself floating in total darkness above a body of water that's totally dark. And the body of water is not moving, 
There's no movement, there's no activity, there's no thought. There's just thatness. And that was how God existed. And then the unmanifested Spirit of God awakened from its rapture of eternal, timeless peace and had a desire to see visible, moving images within the sea of life. And as soon as the Spirit had that desire, it created the smallest of all places within this vast field of thatness. So imagine looking down at this body of water and a tiny pebble drops into it. And immediately there's a center to that infinite sea of water. And like the ripples that are created by the pebble, divine spirit from this smallest of all places, who now felt the existence of the largest of all places, sent out two vortexes in each direction, one spinning clockwise and one spinning counterclockwise. And in each direction, these opposing spinning vortexes traveled in a great circle. out to the farthest point of all places. And because they were spinning in different directions, one, one in a clockwise and one in a counterclockwise, they were drawn to one another and they merged. And one set of dual vortexes, when they merged, created the feminine in, feminine energy, and in the opposite direction, those two spinning vortexes, when they merged, created the masculine energy. Now they were opposite each other, masculine and feminine, and they were drawn back to the smallest of all places. And as they came back and moved into the smallest of all places, they merged and created the Big Bang. Creation was born. And all the images, all the dimensions of consciousness, all the layers of that bubble that Norm witnessed was created. God was so pleased because now it could live in these images and experience the creation through all the images, all the animals, the insects, the birds, us, all the dimensions of consciousness and all the entities that live on these dimensions of consciousness. all was available for him and her to experience.
Yogananda once said, Kriya Yoga takes one to God by the universal highway, the spine. Remember, no matter what our trials have been or how discouraged we are, if we will make a continued effort to be better, we will find that. Being made in the image of God, we are endowed with unlimited power that is much stronger than our worst traits. Let us make up our minds that we will win, focusing all of our concentration on the ceaseless efforts to succeed, and we will surely be victorious. When I read that quote for the first time, I remembered uh, this trip that Missy and I took to Yosemite a few years ago. And we were looking for something, a hike to do, and we got this pamphlet, and it was a hike to the top of Yosemite Falls. And uh, it said, moderate difficulty. <laughs> so we were like, well, we could do moderate. <laughs> coming from virtually sea level with uh, very little hiking uh, under our belt. I had a pair of tennis shoes on, I think. So we started doing this hike, and, uh, you know, obviously it's Yosemite, and the hike is, the path is granite. And at certain parts along the way, they carved granite steps to help you get up, and it's a continuous climb the whole way, and I can't remember what the altitude was, but it was really hard really hard. I mean, we had to stop a lot and just catch our breath and, should we turn back? No, we're going to get there. And, um, and that experience was, we, we got there, we got to the top. But just that, that reminded me of, of uh, you know, just how working with the Kriya and, and experiencing life and having difficulties and, and stumbling and how the path is, it's a path, but it, there's also sometimes there's some steps. And it's like you might have be struggling with having your tongue roll back when you're meditating. But if you keep practicing it and doing it, you'll eventually get to the point where it'll work and it'll stay back there. And that's like taking a step. You've got to step further along the path. And that applies to all the challenges and difficulties that we might have with the technique, because it's a lot to learn at first. It's, it's like when we learned how to drive a car. You know, it was, you had so many things you had to worry about and do, and now it's just automatic, hopefully, for everybody. <laughs> um, so just remember that the, the path, when it can become difficult, if we hang in there, it, we take a step up, and we get closer to our goal. The quote for the talk of today was by Norm, and he said, Plant the seeds of illumination in your life. This is your inheritance. And what he often talked about was that we... Each of us is totally equipped, mentally and physically, to experience cosmic consciousness. We don't have to travel anywhere. We don't have to go anywhere and do anything. It's all within us. And all we have to do is just turn that wheel of meditation. Make the effort. We're never too old to start. And if we hang in there and do that practice every morning and every evening, even if we only have five minutes, to just sit down and calm the breath, start turning the wheel of meditation, and challenge yourselves to do, I'm going to sit for 10 minutes, and now I'm going to sit for 15 minutes without thinking about the, t the clock. And I'm going to go deeper, and I'm going to... Um, 
go through my mala beads and I'm going to go to 24 circulations and then I'm going to go to 36 and eventually I'm going to do 108. It's never, it's never too late to start and we all have the challenges that we each have personally that we have to overcome. But at the end of this Korea retreat, at the end of the year, and now we're embracing a new year, it's a wonderful opportunity to get the right hiking shoes on and uh, equipment and make that journey on the path to your goal of cosmic consciousness. So we, we hope that you come back, that you stay in touch, and reach out to us if you have questions or things you want, would like to have explained to you. <clears throat> Follow me in prayer, please. O oh, Divine Father, Mother, we feel so blessed to be sitting here today, exchanging our energies with one another, and with you. Our hearts are full with love for you, and humbly ask that you guide us each day along the path, picking us up when we stumble, guiding us onward. For our desire, O Lord, is to become a natural man and a natural woman. To know your presence in our lives. To hear your voice. To wrap our arms around you. And embrace you. Thank you for this life. And for this opportunity.
Yeah.